The Virtual Curbside is a production of the Utah Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Utah AAP, working together to improve children's lives through education, advocacy, and networking. Hi, this is Paul Workers from the Utah AAP. Welcome to this week's edition of the Virtual Curbside, where we bring pediatric providers together with subspecialists to get smarter about all things pediatric and better acquainted as a community of caregivers. The Virtual Curbside is brought to you in part by a generous grant from Primary Children's Hospital. Primary Children's Hospital, the child first and always. Welcome back to Virtual Curbside. It's a great pleasure this month to be able to have Dr. Glenn Lau with us from uh, Pediatric Urology. When I was talking to Pat Cartwright a few months ago, we were talking about some topics and he said, you know, the person you really need to talk to is Glenn Lau because he knows all about this sort of stuff. So two things, that's a great endorsement of you, Dr. Lowe, and it's also, I think, an indication I have worn out my welcome with Pat. So uh, <laughs> he's, he's a pretty genteel guy, so I, I think that's hard to do. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Good. Um, and, and Pat, you know, in his defense, he's approaching retirement, so he's kind of uh, here one week and gone the other, and we're glad to have him as long as he'll stick around, but, you know, he's probably off somewhere mountain biking right now. Yeah, no, Pat needs no defense. He, yeah, uh, <laughs> he's, he is he is just a terrific human being, but oh, yeah. he, he spoke very highly of you, and we're, we're looking forward to being able to talk to you. So you're a Michigander originally? Originally, yeah, from the Detroit area, and uh, spent time growing up elsewhere. I learned German like we were speaking earlier when I was in elementary school and living in Austria, so. Well, where did you live? In Graz. In Graz, is, I know Graz. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah I, lived, I lived in Vienna, so. Um, okay. Yeah, Lovely. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so. So we'll set that aside. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you went to medical school in Toledo, is that right? Yep, that's right. University of Toledo, I think is what it's called now, or Medical College of Ohio formerly, yep. Okay. And then from there, you were at Memphis and then came here to do your Peds Fellowship? Correct, yeah. So residency training at University of Tennessee and then here for a two-year pediatric urology fellowship. That's right. And then you stayed. Yeah, you know, they didn't want to air their dirty laundry, I guess. So they kept me around. <laughs> well, like I said, I've only heard nice things. This wasn't your first time in the state of Utah, though. That's correct. Yeah, I did go to Brigham Young University for undergrad. So uh, I have I had been out here before. A few little community college south of here. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I, I, I'm careful who I tell that to here up at the U. So Yeah, okay. <laughs> walk carefully. I wanted to talk this month about some real bread and butter sort of topics in Uh, in urology, things that we deal with all the time, but I don't know that we always have a really great systematic way to approach it. So thanks for indulging us on that one. Yeah, for sure. This week, if possible, we'd like to talk a little bit about about nocturnal aneurysis, uh, aka bedwetting. Before we start, do you have any conflicts you need to disclose? No, no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. Yeah. Okay. Well, so obviously with my youngest patients, uh, we expect them to, uh, to be wet at night because they're infants. When should I consider that, that bedwetting is something that's a problem? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And, you know, some, we, we usually wouldn't start to consider treating this until uh, kids are probably about school age. So, you know, I don't think there's any pediatric urologist out there who would really address something like this until they're at least six years old. Are there any other factors besides age that would make you want to take a, a different kind of approach to this? Um, any patients that we see with developmental delay, that's going to be an obvious reason for them to maybe be a little later in the potty training arena. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a, a child who's on the autism spectrum or something like that, uh, it might be expected that they would not be dry at night. So that'd be one thing to factor in. How about kids who have been dry for a period and are not dry anymore? Is that worrisome? Is there a period of being dry before that should make me think about that? It may kind of factor into, you know, what we consider. Uh, I might ask a little bit more about what kind of, you know, social triggers they might have had, if there were any traumatic events in their life or things that may uh, lead to more of a behavioral health consult or something like that. So, yeah, that is something that we would probably want to tease out. What things are more likely to make a child susceptible to wetting? You often hear about it runs in families. Does it run in families? Uh, it actually does. Yeah, there is definitely a familial component to it. And if you look at even, you know, like monozygotic twin studies, then, you know, the rates are very high in siblings uh, in that way. So 
There seems to be a familial component, although there, I don't think that there is an enuresis gene necessarily that's been identified. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that we always like to tease out first is whether or not there are any daytime symptoms. And I know that we have a separate episode coming down the pike here mm -hmm. um, where we'll address some of those things. But, you know, a child who is having daytime accidents is much more likely also to have nighttime accidents as well. Gotcha. We talked a little bit about developmental issues. When is either the amount of urine a child produces or the size of their bladder an issue? That's something that's kind of difficult to tease out, but you know, we, we can do some things like ultrasounds to estimate bladder capacity or avoiding diaries to see how much kids actually can hold. But that's also not always consistent between the day and nighttime. Also, you'd asked about uh, what was the second one? So you said, about how much urine a child produces. Oh, yeah. So if they're dry during the day, then, you know, typically the likelihood that they are unable to, to hold enough to get through the nighttime is probably less likely unless there's some overactive bladder component or, you know, kind of increased contractility of the bladder. And I'm guessing we'll talk more about that next week because the, the issues of daytime wedding, I think, are in many ways a lot more frustrating for families as well. Can be for sure, yeah. So when you're taking a history, when I'm taking history, what sorts of things should I not miss? Well, I think like we talked about just a second ago, definitely asking about daytime symptoms and then um, constipation would be another thing that can kind of come hand in hand with those issues. Also, you would want to know, you know, are they having any history of infections? I mean, you know, if, if they've had urinary tract infections, then that's something that might lead us down kind of a different path. The other things that we ask about is sometimes you can get an actual voiding diary to kind of parse this out, but if they drink a lot at nighttime, that tends to lead to obviously increased urine output at nighttime. I will ask the parents if they tend to always have to be reminding the child to go to the bathroom and whether or not they will do that right before bedtime to make sure that they're emptying right before. And then I also asked them a little bit about whether or not it seems like the child wakes up when these episodes happen or whether or not they seem to be very difficult to arouse, which is what we hear a lot mm -hmm. uh, from parents who have kids with this issue. Going back, you mentioned uh, avoiding diary. What things would you want people to record in avoiding diary over what period of time and what, what factors are worth looking at? Yeah, this is a difficult one to get uh, to get parents to do well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we'll, we'll typically give them kind of a urine hat and maybe like a graduated type plastic beaker or something like that to measure mm -hmm. um, how much they are taking in and then measure how much they're voiding during the day. Obviously, at nighttime, it's going to be a little bit difficult to figure out how much they're going unless you weigh a diaper. But, you know, that gives us an idea and also can really make the parents realize how much they're drinking and when they are drinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, during the daytime, what kind of issues they might be having that they might have missed. The other thing, I guess, that we would probably want to include in avoiding diary is any accidents. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not obviously measured urine output, but it would help us to, to know, you know, whether or not they're maybe having more of an issue than we thought than just at nighttime. So you'd actually like to know some sense of ins and outs Correct. Uh, yeah, that's day. right. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, you know, as far as timing or how long you want this, you know, it's really nice to see a full week, but that does not, that's not typically um, uh, doable for most parents. Being a parent myself, I can't imagine trying to figure that out for an entire week. But usually I would say we want like a 48 hour avoiding diary. So I tell them maybe to kind of pick a weekend and, and do that. And that way, at least you have an average of a couple of days to kind of see how things are going. For school-age kids to just afternoon ins and outs, or is that meaningful? Problem is that school time is this kind of black box, and mm -hmm. kids aren't always great at telling us, you know, how often they're allowed to go to the bathroom, whether or not they go to the bathroom. And so I think a weekend's usually a little more telling. Okay. All right. Why does constipation make a difference? Uh, constipation goes hand in hand with lower urinary tract dysfunction. I mean, if you kind of, there's a kind of constellation of symptoms we call bowel and bladder dysfunction. And there are a few reasons as to why we think that these issues kind of come together. One of them is kind of the functional behavior of holding or retaining urine in stool. 
um, mm -hmm. that you, you have this kind of problem relaxing both sphincters. But then also the pelvis is a very fixed space. And if you have a lot of hard stool kind of in the pelvis, then that can be kind of external compression on the bladder and then lead to some overactivity and, and feelings of, you know, early fullness and things. So, so actual effective decrease in size of bladder. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. Doing a physical exam, what do I want to know? Are there any red flags? I mean, if you ever have looked at a urology clinic note, you know, we're, uh, we're not known for our comprehensive physical exam necessarily. And I don't think you need to do the full cranial nerves and things. But I think the big things that you'd want to kind of focus on are things that would point you in a direction of a functional or anatomic problem. And so I always take a take a good look at the sacrum to make sure that there's not some sort of maybe like spina bifida occulta, a little tuft or dimple or something in the sacrum might be something that needs to be worked up further. Also in boys, you know, you can take a look, are they circumcised? Do they have a very, very tight phimosis and some irritation kind of around the meatus? In circumcised boys, there is medial stenosis that can sometimes you know, lead to some more functional emptying issues, although that would be extreme. It's not the norm. So you're saying incomplete emptying, is that? Correct, yeah, okay. or, or at least high pressure voiding. Okay. And then, you know, in girls, you can look for, you know, pooling of urine in the vagina, just kind of irritation in the introitus and, and that kind of thing that might suggest that they're a little that they're wet all the time. It's also, you know, you can look at the underwear and you can see if there are streaks or, you know, there's wetness, right? And that can kind of tip you off to some daytime problems too. Sure. I'm guessing almost all these kids will need a UA. Yeah, most of the time we're going to get a UA just as a kind of first glance with any type of voiding problem, yes. Yeah. And I'm guessing, you know, lo looking for signs of infection, looking for, I mean, sugar would be a... Sugar would be a big one, yeah. Story. Obviously, any time that you're having any type of incontinence, you know, you want to make sure you're ruling out diabetes. Yeah, you know? yeah. The That's... other thing you can look at is specific gravity as well. You know, if they're super, super dilute, then, you know, you can have an issue with a kid that just drinks too much, you know, so... Sure. It's a possibility, even though we usually encourage hydration. Sure. Are there any other labs that would be helpful? If it's really just monosymptomatic uh, nocturnal enuresis, you don't typically need any other lab work. Okay. Any helpful radiography? My my guess is, is that I'm probably going to be talking to you before I do any imaging. Yeah. I mean, no one's ever going to fault you for getting a renal bladder ultrasound and having like pre and post void bladder images just to make sure that a kid's emptying their bladder. But typically if they're dry during the daytime, that's not really necessary. And they've, you know, and they've never had infections or anything like that. But yeah, I think with this problem alone, it's not necessary to get any imaging specifically. Okay. So let's say that we've decided that the child is otherwise healthy and this seems like garden variety nocturnal enuresis. What do I do now? Well, you know, I, I like to kind of talk about first, second, and third line therapies, right? And, sure. you know, we, this, is, uh, this is not a surgical issue. And so, you know, I try to reassure parents that they, they're not going to be going to the operating room for this. And I also like to reassure the child that this is actually a very common issue, mm -hmm. not something that they're likely to hear about at lunchtime, right? But something that likely a number of their friends have dealt with as well. And so, you know, once we kind of help normalize it a little bit for the patient and the parents, then we talk about the first line of things, which would be kind of the behavioral and kind of, I guess, urinary hygiene type interventions that we can do. Those would include, first off, that you want to kind of restrict fluid near bedtime. So I always tell kids that, you know, you want to make sure that you're staying nice and hydrated during the day. We don't want to be dehydrated and then try and catch up right before bed. And so I say, you know, have, you know, a glass of whatever with dinner, but then just make sure that it's just a couple of sips when you brush your teeth. And then also making sure that they really, the last thing before they go to bed, use the bathroom so that they actually start, you know, with an empty bladder. So those are kind of the first things and they sound very obvious, but sometimes parents are like, yeah, we really haven't paid attention to that too much. So that would be kind of first line. Then second line treatments are basically twofold. And, you know, we think of nocturnal enuresis as, as being one of three issues with some 
patients having a combination of those issues, right? So the first is a urine volume issue. And so if we have uh, basically a natural, normal adult uh, cyclic release of antidiuretic hormone, then we'll reduce our urine output at night by about 50%. And so in some kids, they don't release that in a normal adult cyclic fashion. And so we can give them a synthetic version of that. So that's your Desmopressin. Mm -hmm. um, that would be, you know, not, it's not going to cure it, right? Because mm -hmm. you're just basically kind of giving an adjunct hormone there. But where we know that a large number of these kids get better on their own with time, then if it's a very worrisome, stressful thing for them, then that can kind of give them some relief while they're in the process of growing out of things. Well, it's nice to have a sleepover solution too. That, that exactly. It's gotta be dry. Use it periodically, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be every yeah. night. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. Sleepover, summer camps, those types of things it tends to be a nice little, nice little holdover. So that would be a second line treatment. The, the other is bedwetting alarms. This is one that, you know, I'll have parents who have come and, you know, said that they've struggled with this and they've tried the alarm and it didn't work. And I spend a little time to kind of ask them how they used it because they'll say things like, well, it didn't wake them up and mm -hmm. they're a really deep sleeper. And this is a, a therapy where we're trying to basically make these kids more arousable. And if you look at kind of the, the sleep literature on this, it's interesting because they talk about these kids being quote unquote, deep sleepers, right? So you would think that they might be kind of in those deeper stages of sleep more than kids who uh, do not wet the bed. But it turns out they probably have about the same amount of deep versus REM sleep. It's just that they really cannot just wake up. And so these bedwetting alarms, what they do is, you know, they either vibrate or ring or both, and you can put them either in the underwear and a pad under the bed, and there are all sorts of different variations of these. But Basically, the parent has to be almost as motivated as a child to get this done because these kids that are really not arousable, at first, they're going to have to wake up with the kid, get them out of bed, make sure that they wake up all the way, make sure that they go to the bathroom, make sure they change their sheets, change their clothes and all that before they get back in bed. And so it really is kind of a team effort mm -hmm. to use those properly. And it's also not something that works within a week. You know, I think we usually encourage them to try it for at least two months before they give up on it. So it can be a lot of work, but it's also, you know, if used properly has a, a pretty decent success rate. So those are kind of our second line things. What about other medications? There's certainly talk about using something like imipramine. Mm -hmm. for, for yeah. Medicine. And, you know, in my practice and in my training, I, I really haven't used tricyclics too much in this entity. We tend to err more on the side of uh, using an anticholinergic. Mm -hmm. um, so if they don't have any sort of underlying, you know, constipation, there are studies that suggest that that there can be actual overactivity that it's that's limited to nighttime in these kids. Mm -hmm. So they're not actually having urgency during the day and frequency, but at night, for whatever reason, the bladder is overactive. And so the third line, for me at least, and I think most of our practice, tends to be more oxybutynin or a drug like that. Mm -hmm. Are there patients that you say, why don't you just put this on a shelf for a while and, and revisit this in six months? Absolutely, yeah. I think, you know, when I describe the, the uh, bedwetting alarm to some parents, they're saying, well, I think I'll deal with the laundry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a good number. And I really think that when you're dealing with younger patients, right, that are somewhat more immature and don't seem like they're the ones that care about this, mm -hmm. you know, your six-year-olds and even some of your seven, eight-year-olds, if they're not frustrated, then I try to tell the parents that, you know, this is something that we would probably want to treat when they are actually the ones that are kind of wanting to treat it. There are some parents who say, you know, the whether diapers or pull-ups or whatever a child's wearing at, at night, are so absorbent that there's not a disincentive. And so they put a child in underpants so that they can feel wet. Is that helpful? I mean, is, is that, a, I guess, um, a creation on the alarm? Yeah, I think, you know, if they're arousable enough to respond to 
an alarm. Maybe they're arousable enough to respond to, you know, wetness, but it seems like a lot of these kids who are not as arousable probably wouldn't respond to either. And I run into parents where they say that the pull-up is just kind of a safety blanket and, you know, oh. we need to kind of get out of that. I haven't really noticed it helping or hurting one way or the right. other. It seems also that where it does seem to run in families that often there's one parent or the other who may have had the same issue. And I don't know whether that makes the conversation e easier or harder sometimes. Yeah, it, I mean, I guess it depends on the parent, right? At least that that normalizes it a little bit. They typically know that, well, at some point I got over it and we'll get over it at some point with him or her as well. But I think it does help to point out that it can run in families and in 99% of kids, by the time they're teenagers, it will be gone. But uh, it's just, you know, something that sometimes will hang on a little longer than others. Are there any data to support the old pediatrician tale that if there was a parent who had nocturnal enuresis and they outgrew it at 12, that that's about the age? Does timing run in families? Because people say that sometimes. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any specific data. I think we just kind of, we know that it, that there is an increased incidence in family members who had it. I don't think that it's necessarily the severity or the, the length of time necessarily correlates. And I think we can both agree that a punitive approach is probably not helpful. That's correct. Yeah. In reassuring and saying this is normal, I think it's also important to say that disincentives are probably not useful in this case. Yeah. Right, right. So who needs to see you? Which of the kids should I say, hey, you really need to go see Dr. Lowell? Well, I think in these cases, it depends on kind of how comfortable you are with managing this, right? We know that if it's just primary nocturnal enuresis, that they probably aren't really in danger of this causing any long-term adverse effects. But and if you wanted to try desmopressin or something as kind of a, a, a first or second line, then that's totally fine. But I think that if they're refractory to kind of our first or second line therapies, then that's probably someone to send our way. Also, if they have any other kind of uh, underlying issues, like they've had urinary tract infections, you know, you see anything anatomic or questionable on their exam, or, you know, if they are having those daytime symptoms as well, um, you know, that's somebody that could probably be sent our way. Sounds great. Any other wisdom about bedwetting? No, I mean, it's, I just think that statistics are sometimes really helpful. And if you say that, you know, 15% of all five-year-olds are still wetting the bed, that's a lot of kids. And yeah. then 15% of those will get better every year as you go along. So Reassurance, I think, is very important and putting it into perspective with the parents helps. Um, so if you say, you know, by the time we're off to college, pretty much no one's having this issue, that tends to lighten the mood a little bit. Clearly as well that, uh, you know, if somebody has gotten that much older, that partnering with you guys is probably... Absolutely. Yeah. If, yeah. if someone's well into kind of post-pubertal time, then uh, yeah, we'd probably want to see them. Yeah. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Those of you who have questions, please send your questions to questions at thecurb.com. We'll talk about those in a couple of weeks. We're hoping that you're willing to come back next week and we'll talk about some daytime wedding. Sounds great. All right. See you then. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to getting together again next time. The virtual curbside is available on iTunes or wherever you find your other favorite podcasts. Be sure to like us and subscribe. We want you to like us both because we're needy that way and because that will help other listeners like you find us. Check out our website, vcurb.com, for supporting materials, schedules, and other great stuff. The Virtual Curbside is an educational production of the Utah chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The opinions expressed in this podcast, while carefully considered, are ultimately the opinions of the presenters and not necessarily of the American Academy of Pediatrics or our employers. And remember, the content of this podcast shouldn't be seen as a substitute for seeking actual personal medical care. If this is an emergency, hang up and dial 911. Otherwise, schedule a visit with a caring health care provider to try to get to the bottom of your concerns. None of this could happen without Elisa Stoddard, our extraordinary executive director of the Utah AAP. Many thanks to Tim Cosgrove for his help on the website and logo design. Production design and editing thanks to Phil Workus, who also composed the theme music. See you next time.